So hi everyone and welcome to this webinar, which is of course all about how we can be improving our relationship with money and it's organised by the Wealthy Her Network. I'm Vicky Sayers and I am a presenter and producer for Share Radio. We're a financial radio station dedicated to making money matters accessible for everyone. And it's through Share Radio's work with Wealthy Her that I've had the pleasure of meeting some of their fantastic team. And uh, this is the reason that I'm here hosting for them tonight. Really happy to be here and to be introducing our experts who we'll be hearing a lot more from later. So we've got Annabelle Bosman, who is Head of Relationship Management at RBC Wealth Management, and Jitanjali Sharma, who is a director at HSBC private banking. So before we hear from them, let's hear a little bit more about the people who've brought us here this evening. So the Wealthy Her Network launched last year on International's Women's, International Women's Day, supported by finance partners and ambassadors. And they're all working together for the first time to change the finance industry for the better. And what they want to do is they want to arm women with the financial knowledge and confidence that they need to grow and protect their wealth. And they also want to ensure that the finance industry is a better place to understand empower and enable them to do this. And of course, I feel like the subject of money mindset and improving our relationship with money does feel particularly important right now. A lot of us will be feeling the financial pressure due to the current global pandemic that we're all experiencing. So to start with, I just wanted to summarize the current landscape when it comes to women and money and to introduce some statistics, which I think will really help to illustrate why it is so important that we start to talk about this. 70% of women lack financial confidence and they lose nearly one million pounds across their lives as a result. And in the past year, the UK has slipped from 15th to 21st place in the World Economic Forum's Gender Economic Parity Rankings. And then the gender pay gap here in the UK is currently at 17.3%, and that's not going to close until at least 2050. And then when it comes to planning for the future, you've got an investment gender gap as well. So that's uh, where just in, one in five women currently hold an investment, and that's compared to more than a third of men currently. So why is it the women are less engaged at this point? Well, according to the Wealthy Her report carried out last year, First of all, 81% of women say that it is important to be financially independent, and 66% of them do say that they want to educate themselves further in financial matters. However, they face challenges when they try to engage with the industry. So 36% have stated a lack of knowledge or too much complexity as the reason that they don't really want to get involved any further in their finances. And you've got the same number, so 36%, who say that they feel patronized by the financial services industry. And if you delve a little bit further into that, there are 28% of women, according to this report, that say that the industry is overly reliant on jargon. So that reduces their understanding and also their trust. And relationship status can also have an impact on this. So according to the study, we've got 62% of British women who have said they've opted out of participating in long-term financial decisions because they feel that their spouses are somehow better informed and better placed to handle things. And then on the other side of that, getting divorced massively affects financial self-esteem in women for the worst. So there really is a need for women to get involved right now. There are a number of key moments in a woman's life as well where the decision she makes will have a huge effect on her earning potential and on her finances in general. So something as simple as choosing what job you want to do, and then maybe further down the line, whether or not you want to become a mother, and then decisions around planning for later life, and then any potential ill health that they could come across in the future. And I've got a couple more examples and some stats from the International Women's Forum that really illustrate this. So a mother in her 40s working full time who's had children by the age of 33 will on average earn 7% less than a woman who hasn't had any children. But then you flip the coin and by contrast, men with children somehow earn 20% more than men without children. And then also you've got 55% of women aged 30 and above who have not thought about how they are going to pay for their care in the future. So all in all, I think we can really see that women lose out in financial situations, and that's not least through a lack of confidence in the system. So I feel like this is something that the financial services industry really needs to be better supporting and understanding here. So now that I've hopefully set the scene for you, it is of course time to introduce our experts. Annabelle and Jatanjali, thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of this conversation this evening. So Annabelle, why don't we start with you? You can introduce yourself again and, and let, tell us a little bit about why you feel so strongly about this topic. Sure, thanks Vicky. Thank you for having me. So um, Annabelle Bosman, I am Head of Relationship Management at Royal Bank of Canada um, here in London. 
I've spent uh, more years than I care to admit to, about 25 years now working um, in wealth management specifically. Um, so always within the private banking sector, uh, both as an investment advisor, uh, more recently on the relationship management side um, and at RBC, obviously in a, a leadership and management role. Um, I think fair to say, you know, why, why am I so passionate about this particular subject? I think as you work within wealth management, typically you find your areas of expertise. They, they're usually aligned with your own interests. And of course, selfishly, I am a woman. So therefore, you know, I care, um, in, I care about this a lot. Um, I think you talked to some of the statistics as to, to why we, we should be talking about this, why it is important. And frankly, why we as an industry haven't got it right until this point. Um, I've always had these conversations within the organizations that I've worked for. Um, and I'm incredibly pleased that um, RBC uh, were very supportive when we started the conversation with Wealthy Her Network, who are so focused on not just changing the conversation within one organization, but changing the focus of the industry as a whole, which I think is incredibly important. Great, thank you, Annabelle. And Jitanjali, how about you, if you reintroduce yourself and tell us why you find this so important? Hi, hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Vicky. I'm Gitanjali Sharma, and I'm a director at HSBC Private Bank here in the UK. I'm also the UK lead for our Next Generation program, and uh, very happy to be here with you this evening. Um, so, as I said, I work in sales and relationship management. And as part of the Next Generation program, I found that we know the statistics that almost 40 trillion will pass on to the millennial cohort in the next decade but actually most women outlive their husbands and most men do tend to bequeath their finances their liquid finances to their wives so really women are the first next gen and so it's important that we engage with them proactively to empower them with financial knowledge so they feel confident making important financial decisions so we went away and did some uh, research, um, and we also um, participated in some of the research that Wealthy Her did independently. And just to reiterate some of the statistics, right? we know in the UK by 2025, women alone will control almost 60% um, of the UK's wealth. And we know that in the millennial cohort, uh, you know, the split between um, male and female is 50-50, right? So 50% of uh, female millennials are turning to entrepreneurship and therefore are quite front-footed when it comes to finance, raising finance or discussing you know, their financial needs. And here in the UK, you have, I think you alluded to yourself, you know, the 30% club and there's this active um, uh, you know, conversation around shrinking the gender pay gap. But not all the statistics we, we discovered were as pretty, right? We know that today, globally, the number of single parent households is at an all time high. And we also know that most of those households are led by women. And so uh, they have this responsibility of making crucial financial decisions almost thrust upon them. Similarly, we know, you know, also from, you know, just people that we know in our own uh, social network, that it's always, it tends to be the women who step back to take care of aging parents or a disabled relative. And so they're making those key financial choices for them as well. And as part of some of the research we did, we found that near 60% of the widows, the divorcees that we interviewed, um, they deeply regretted the fact that when they were part of a couple, they weren't more actively involved in financial dialogue. Um, and almost three quarters of them just don't rate themselves as being uh, confident to make important financial choices. And so, you know, we figured that it's almost, you know, a, a sort of a fiduciary responsibility for the industry now to do more uh, to equip women. And you just use a very crude phrase, you know, it is true that money does make the world go round. So, you know, whether you're looking to raise funds to start a business or you need to buy a home, you know, you've got to put down your own money, you've got to find a decent mortgage. Eventually, you've got to find enough liquidity to pay down that mortgage. Uh, you know, want to have money to plan for a debt-free retirement. So, you know, money touches every aspect of our lives. So it is important that women feel empowered and confident. Uh, to talk more openly and you know, make important strategic decisions for themselves. Great, thank you so much, Jitanjali. And just for everyone listening, just to let you know, uh, uh, through the course of this conversation, I'm going to be asking Jitanjali and Annabelle some questions. But if any questions come to your mind through the course of our conversation, there will be time towards the end uh, where we will be opening the floor for, for Q and A. So um, if you have anything that pops to your mind, please do feel free to write it in the chat, and we will we will get to that. 
Um, so Annabelle, if I just come back to you, um, how have you come to focus on empowering women to actively control their finances? Um, so I think this started um, when I was uh, working as a relationship manager and I was very much focused on women working across the city. So professional women, uh, backgrounds in investment banking, law firms, accountancy firms, so professionals who'd earned their, um, earned their wealth. And what really struck me was even within that population, um, women still didn't feel confident to have those conversations around money. And I think that is, you know, is really telling. If you've got women who on a day-to-day -day basis are making investment decisions on behalf of the organizations they work with, yet they still don't feel empowered enough to make the financial decisions, as we heard from Jitanjali, uh, within their own households. So I think you know, that for me gave me um, the, the push to really focus on, on how we talk to women, how we make sure that they do get that confidence, that we're creating um, safe spaces where they don't feel um, stupid about asking a question. There is no such thing as a stupid question when it comes to talking about your finances. And I think we as an industry have to make sure that we're supporting women in those conversations. Um, I think if you, you look at how we have made steps forward in terms of narrowing gaps in earnings um, and, and careers, we are still far from where we should be um, on the investment side. As you, you highlighted at the beginning, Vicky, talking about the investment gap, um, we still know that the, an estimated 15 billion held in investments um, in the UK from women uh, versus 30 billion by men. So we've got a huge amount of work to do. And I think it's only by focusing on women as a, a subset, and that's not to say that women want to be spoken in a different way. They want you know, everything to be pink and fluffy, not at all. Actually, it's about making those conversations you know, easier, uh, cutting through the jargon, um, and ensuring that we're, we're creating those and supporting those, uh, those life-changing decisions. Great, Annabelle, thank you so much. And Jitanjali, how about you? Do you need me to repeat the question or are you okay? <laughs> no, I'm good, thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so similar to Annabelle, actually, I have spent almost 20 years in client-facing roles across wealth management and private banking. And so my motivation, again, comes from actually talking to clients, being face-to-face. -face. Uh, you know, it's a bit cliched, but it is true that the typical private banking client is male and generally in the age group of 55 to 60. And as and when that eventuality does strike, you know, you're faced with the surviving spouse. And the, the, the level of questions that you get from them, uh, sometimes you know, it, it's heartbreaking, you know, because you realize that their you know, financial knowledge is just not commensurate with the level of wealth that they're now responsible for. And so we realize that you know, a lot needs to be done urgently uh, you know, to, to equip women. And, you know, it's, it's, I think it isn't a coincidence that, you know, one of the UN's uh, sustainable development goals, I think it's number five, you know, is gender equality. And gender equality will be driven, um, you know, e in equal measure by uh, financial independence and financial equality. And I think we all realize that if women are increasingly controlling more and more wealth, right, they're creating wealth as entrepreneurs or you know, successful career women as they, um, you know, they, they get onto higher education and therefore, you know, higher paying jobs. But they're also, as Annabelle alluded to, they're controlling and directing more wealth. You know, whether they're, ha they're in roles at the IMF or the World Bank, you know, you have more female uh, fund managers and asset management businesses. You have more women working in uh, the sovereign wealth funds, you know, in the Middle East, for instance. Uh, so, you know, it's important to realize that as women make the right financial choices, they're contributing to the financial well-being of their families, you know, of the communities they live in, and just, you know, the wider society uh, that we're all living in, you know, the wider world. Uh, so it's important to make sure that they're comfortable um, in all aspects of it and feel more confident about it and happy, you know, dealing with it. Because one of the other things that all research, I think, points to is that women all, almost view it as a burden, right? It is an emotional burden, and they, they view it as, you know, they're sort of, in a fiduciary way, uh, taking care of it to pass it on to the next generation. So they clearly, you know, take it very seriously, you know, and they want to learn and they want to do the right thing, um, you know, for that wealth and for the next generation. Great. And so, potentially staying with you for a bit longer, um, perhaps a little bit more uh, from a personal point of view, why, why does empowering women with their finances really resonate with you? 
So again, you know, I find that typically women tend to be bashful and reticent, you know, when it comes to discussing money matters. And I think a lot of that has to do with the patriarchal, um, you know, social structure that we have all evolved from, right? When men went out hunting and they, you know, uh, brought home, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know, the leaves and whatever else. <laughs> and women historically, uh, you know, have been shut out, uh, you know, of the dialogue uh, around wealth creation, wealth preservation. And they've only sort of made inroads in business or the workforce, um, you know, over the last perhaps 80 or 90 years. And now we need to accelerate that. I think that a lot of that is happening um, over the last decade. And so I just feel from my own personal experience and talking to um, the women that, you know, we face off to. I mean, I've had people call me and say things like, uh, and it's happened now, you know, given this costly situation that the world is enduring. Uh, well, I know my husband was a great man. He did a lot to create a nest egg for us. And I know he has a will, but I have no clue where, it's, where it is. Do you know where I could find it? And then you realize that, you know, people just don't talk enough about money matters in their homes, you know, men to the women, women to men, women to children. Um, so that there, really, there just is a lot of ground to be covered. Great, thank you. And Annabelle, how about you? Um, well, I think my starting point is a, is a pretty personal one. I have a, a son and a daughter and, you know, I, I want them to have the same approach, the same um, education when it comes to understanding their finances and ultimate, ultimately the, the same ability to, to manage the, the, the family wealth, um, as it were, you know, what, as and when they're, they're earning. I think the interesting thing that, you know, we've, we've also um, done a lot of studies at, at RBC I think one of the interesting things that um, Jitanjali touched upon earlier is that actually, you know, when we talk about men versus women uh, and their approach to wealth, yes, they often see it as something of a burden. Uh, they typically view wealth as um, a means to achieve a series of life goals, whereas men quite often view wealth as a means in itself. Um, but I think a really interesting statistic is that most women, some 42% of women versus 24% of men, um, actually see that ability to pass on what they've created as being a driving factor uh, for the wealth in the first place. So therefore, you, know, you, you can really see the societal benefit of, of helping women to, um, when they've created that wealth, um, understand what they need to do to be able to protect and pass it on. Um, and I think, you know, that has to be a very strong moral argument for wanting to, to help women get this right. Great. And then sticking with you, Annabelle, um, do you see, obviously, through the course of your work, do you see differences in attitudes to wealth and confidence levels in women compared to men? Like, is it really, you know, that obvious when they come in and talk to you? Um, I think it's quite often generational. Um, so, you know, there is less of a marked difference as you move uh, past uh, millennials. So millennials, Gen Z, there is much more of a, a, a narrowing of the gap in that confidence level between men and women. But baby boomers, um, Gen Z, I think typically you do see a real lack of confidence. Um, and that's probably a lot to do with the fact that typically if you survey millennial women on, um, they are much more comfortable saying that, you know, yes, I, you know, I intend to earn my wealth, you know, be it entrepreneurial, be it through uh, career earnings, perhaps in older generations. Um, but I think actually there's, you know, what we see is an assumption typically that once you've created the wealth, you should know what to do with it. And, and it's not quite as straightforward and simple as that. You know, I, I've sat in, in round tables with groups of women uh, where women have sold businesses for 50 to 100 million, you know, clearly very smart, very competent, very able. And yet they still talk about this lack of confidence when it comes to sitting in a room with investment bankers to talk about the value of their company. You know, there is still that gap um, in confidence. And the other thing that we quite often see, um, and more in women than in men, is that they have been so focused on their businesses or on their careers um, that quite often their personal finances get left behind. And I think that's particularly prevalent with women uh, because we all know as women, we tend to have you know, a whole myriad of, of competing priorities, uh, be it family, be it our jobs, and quite often finances 
just get pushed um, off the plate uh, in favor of other things. So again, you know, it's down to the financial sector to help support women prioritize and make sure they understand um, once they've created the wealth, what they should be doing with it. Great. And Jatanjali, how about you? How, what has your experience been through your, your career? Yeah, thanks, Vicky. So very similar to uh, what Annabelle has said. Most of that resonates, actually, because, you know, you hear the proverbial, you know, from a man, oh, I picked up that tip at the golf course, right? So you know that men are talking money, you know, and it and quite um, openly. Whereas when a group of women get together, you know, it's about, you know, life issues, it's about domestic issues, it's more emotional, right? They're talking about, you know, who's a good piano teacher and, you know, what's the best school of nursery in the neighborhood. Because, you know, they're also tasked with those decisions, right? They're also at the end of the day um, performing multiple roles, right? And if they're not women with children, then they've got to think about, you know, potentially their parents. Um, so I think women therefore don't have, um, you know, that sort of access to what people are doing, you know, what are the trends in the market, financial trends, you know, because they don't have those clues. So I think as an industry, you know, we, we pick up on that and we need to bridge that gap. Um, the other a distinction I'd say is actually between the inheritors and, um, you know, the, the entrepreneurs in the C-suite, more of the C-suite, because I think the C-suite tend to be people who've had, um, you know, sort of advanced qualifications and therefore have worked there up the chain. And typically they will, you know, will be in some sort of a professional qualification that's gotten them there. Whereas the inheritors, you know, are the ones who potentially may have, you know, more um, queries and, you know, more gaps in, in knowledge potentially, but uh, will be very reticent in discussing it. Whereas I think at least our C-suite clients will then come to the table and say, you know, uh, that's a fair bit of jargon. You need to demystify that, you know, fairly quickly. Um, so equally between, um, you know, the age gap does, does play a factor, you know, baby boomers and millennials. The baby boomers typically will have more wealth, I think, you know, as you've gone through life, um, potentially inherited or made it yourself even. They do have more wealth and they see themselves as custodians, but um, they are more reticent to discussing it and asking for help. Whereas the millennials, I think because they're running their own businesses, they're used to company balance sheets, looking for, you know, managing cash flows, looking for funding. They're more front footed and confident, uh, asking for help when it comes to managing their own wealth. Um, so yeah, I think you know, a lot of that rest Annabelle has covered. Great, thank you, Jitanjali. And then sticking with you again, well, of course, the, I think the main word we've been saying so far today uh, through the course of this chat is confidence, confidence, confidence. Um, as women's economic wealth is increasing across the world, do you think that's going to be something that causes a shift in, in confidence in women in general? Or is that something that's a little bit too kind of out of reach for them to kind of realise? So look, as we see, as we've alluded to, c three clients and entrepreneurs, they're getting to talk more and more about wealth. And, and as Annabelle has said, you know, what do you do with it once you have it, right? And then you need to help them go down that journey. You know, why did you embark, embark on that, that journey um, of wealth creation, right? It's so that you have a nest egg, you have a debt free, you know, retirement to look forward to, you bequeath and whatever their goals are. So help them then analyze that this is why you did it and these are the next steps and take you know, ownership and you know, be proud of what you've created. And you know, so not only are they creating more wealth, they're also controlling and directing more wealth. And so as you know, women see these visible role models, uh, you know, this, what they call a representation bias, right? So if you look around you and you see people like you in these roles, you know, that's inspiring. And that then gives you the confidence uh, to make similar decisions and you know to discuss these issues uh, you know with confidence and as openly i think increasingly the industry is also moving away from just a um, sort of return oriented uh, dialogue right we're also moving towards esg sustainability impact and rightly so because uh, you know the time has come and these issues also resonate deeply with women so a lot of the research you know that hsbc did um, talks about how women care about impact and the wider good their wealth will do after meeting the needs of just their you know, immediate um, family and you know, potentially the local church, the local community. What can you do globally uh, to make an impact on you know, pressing um, you know, issues that face us all in the next generation? So as we start addressing those, I think they will want to engage more closely with us and be a part of our dialogue and listen to what we have to say. 
Great, thank you. And Annabelle, what do you think? So I think to Tangeli's point around, you know, more women having seats at the table is, is the key here. Um, clearly, you know, more diversification of thought uh, coming from women, uh, more women challenging uh, the financial sector uh, to help support them. That has to be a good thing and will help drive up confidence because if you see it right, you can, you can aim to be it. So I think that is the key. I think the, the other thing that our studies at RBC have found is that actually um, this starts to benefit us all. Um, more wealth equals more impact. Um, you know, women at the highest levels of wealth ultimately help society. Uh, what we've seen is as women and younger people acquire more wealth, um, they become quite focused, as Jitanjali said, on making a positive impact to society. And actually, when we look at um, younger women who we surveyed um, in, the, um, in the highest wealth bracket, um, they're much more likely to give back to, uh, to society uh, versus male, uh, male counterparts. And what they're looking to do is really align their investment goals with their, with their own moral guiding compass, if you like. Um, and again, I think that's, you know, that's a really positive outcome of our ability to change and drive this conversation going forward and drive women's confidence. Great, and Annabelle, we are of course talking about how uh, the finance industry does need to change to improve for women. Um, I mean, what are some, some practical things that you think they can do to do that? Not just for women, but for, for clients overall as well. Stop mansplaining, <laughs> I think would be the, would be the first one. Um, you look, we're, we are incredibly guilty um, as an industry of tying ourselves up in jargon and making it all sound you know very complicated when actually you know with if we cut through the jargon and helped our clients demystify um, a lot of the investments that we're talking about actually you know it, it's not that complicated so i i think we have to stop hiding behind um our own language uh challenges as a starting point and and hopefully you know with with guidance from the regulator, we are we get called out on that quite a lot. So it is definitely getting better. Um, I think we have to help educate our clients, and that's not just the clients who are the wealth owners today, uh, but help drive that conversation with the next generation of clients. So you know, with their children, help support the conversations between families. You know, as Jitanjali said earlier, uh, quite often those conversations don't happen within families but we can help drive them. You know, we can almost help broker some of those conversations. So I think that's, that's very important. The sort of the key themes for me would be uh, demystification and education. Great, and Jitanjali, did you have anything else that you'd like to add to that one? Um, yeah, just, just a few uh, points. You know, when we did our research, women did feel that we don't really belong. Uh, we're not clients of the industry. Uh, so we also need to, you know, apart from demystifying concepts and the way we communicate, reducing jargon, it's things like, um, you know, the form of engagement. Uh, historically, uh, you know, our events would start at 6.30 or 7 and then we'd have these dinners going on till late, which suits the typical well, you know, fund manager lifestyle where they can leave office at 6, 6.30 and then join you later. But most women want to be home at that time. You know, they want to be reading to a child or, you know, they want to eat with their children or, you know, check on their homework. So, you know, we realize that potentially interaction should move to earlier in the day. And you, you need to show that you're, you're, you're sensitive to these nuances and that you're listening and then, you know, you're um, changing your course accordingly. Uh, we've also started to move away from these very large auditorium style events, you know, 100 people and, you know, to listen to an investment seminar because, you know, typically the handful of women that showed up felt completely out of their depth. Uh, you know, they wouldn't want to ask questions because they kind of felt, you know, that it's a silly question and, you know, demand them, you know, what does it look like? So, so we've reduced the, the group size and, you know, we're having smaller, uh, almost like uh, round table discussions with women. And also to give them, I think women also, we find, um, like an opportunity to talk to like-minded women, you know, whether it's as a mentor, um, you know, just to network. So we're trying to create more and more of those opportunities, but in smaller, more intimate settings. Uh, we also feel that women want to receive information in different ways. You know, not all women are up for the 20-page PDF documents that we historically have been sending out, right? They want to receive their information 
you know, potentially as a visual, you know, so bite-sized videos, which are informative, or potentially as podcasts, you know, so as you're, you know, dropping a child and then going to work, you know, you can listen to that. Um, so we've started to engage with them in, in, at a different level and through different um, media as well. And like I said earlier, uh, you know, trying to move away from just the, um, you know, the communication, which is all about returns and IRR, but trying to change the dial and you know, pivot towards impact. Um, and sustainability and other things that are you know, more um, you know, of interest to them, closer to their hearts. Great. Okay, so we've gone into quite a lot of detail about what we feel like the financial industry can and should be doing. Um, what about some other services and tools um, that can be implemented to help women overcome financial challenges? Jatanjali, what, what do you think there? So, uh, I think we all are, all of us say that our experience has shown that millennial women are quite comfortable, uh, you know, with digital tools, you know, they're quite tech savvy. So we've started using um, technology uh, and digital tools far more actively. Things like this, you know, this webinar, I think is fantastic, right? So Wealthy Her are doing a phenomenal job because this is a closed group. It's a safe space where, you know, people can, um, you know, ask relevant questions. Um, and like I alluded to earlier, you know, we're changing how we give out information, how we update women, um, you know, through podcasts and it's now a video clips. Um, we're also changing the face of finance, uh, you know, as far as we can, we're changing our panels. So we're trying to, as far as possible, have 50-50, um, you know, gender uh, diverse panels. So if you've got four people on the stage, you'll try and make it a point to have two women, uh, you know, at a panel discussion. Um, similarly, front office teams are now, um, you know, far more diverse. And uh, we realize that, you know, women don't want to just deal with female advisors, right? So we'll try and have a 50-50 balance, uh, you know, so we, again, representation bias, right? So they see someone that looks like themselves that across them and that, you know, feels, feels confident. Um, so, yeah. Great. And Annabelle, what do you think? Um, so I think it's it's an interesting one. I think we as an industry um, have done a, a good job, but have probably got further to go on taking the conversation away from just being very focused on products. Um, so again, you know, Jitanjali made the point earlier about this very heavy focus on returns, uh, which I think is of less interest to women. Um, so what we try to do is deepen those conversations, move it away from purely being about products and services um, and actually deepen it to what's important to you. So getting women to talk about their financial goals in terms of almost a series of life pictures and how you can achieve those. You know, I think that's changing that conversation um, is an incredibly powerful tool uh, rather than just starting with, you know, well, here's a set of investment products. Do you want A, B or C? actually talk to us you know tell us what you're trying to achieve and then we you know we work out the best way to to go about that um so i think that you know that's been a, a real shift um that i've seen within the industry in the the 25 years that i've i've worked within it which is a a shift for the positive in my view um i i think there is you know a there is a real um, understanding now um, that a lot of our clients come to us um, armed, particularly younger generations, come armed with um, expectations, with a lot of information that they've gleaned online, uh, which is great. Um, there is also a commensurate amount of disinformation, uh, which I think as wealth managers, you know, we have a uh, a, a duty to try and um, help demystify, to help educate, uh, and to tell them that you know sometimes those too good to be true um, adverts are because they're too good to be true. Um, so you know I think there's quite a lot of work that that we can do in that space as well. Um, and then, uh, as Jatanjali said, you know helping to create almost a frictionless. Um, way of communicating, um, again, particularly speaking to younger generations, but as we've seen in the last couple of months, it's more relevant now for clients as a whole. So how can they have frictionless access to, uh, to their wealth managers, um, be it directly in person or uh, via uh, emails, via, via tech? And I think our ability to switch between, um, between those becomes more key as we move forward. 
Right, and then and sticking a little bit uh, with, with some of the things you were saying there, obviously we are uh, in a webinar right now, we've got some people listening and there are some questions that we will get to, uh, but a bit more generally, um, what can those listening now do to take a step to manage their finances or even to help someone else control their finances? Because especially with women, I don't know, talking from my own personal experience, they might be trying to help their parents, you know, sort out their finances, something like that. Annabelle, what do you think? So I always end up name checking the same book in these conversations. Um, uh, Mer Merrin Somerset Webb, um, a fantastic journalist, has, has written a book called Love Is Not Enough. Um, if you haven't read it, it is a great place to start. It, it really cuts through um, a lot of the, um, the complex ideas of, of what it means to look at your finances. So you know, if, if you're new to it, I'd say go out, get a copy. It's a great place to start. And from there, I think, you know, you can really push yourself to, uh, to drive the conversation. You know, have a look at your own finances. What are the goals that are important to you? Um, there are lots of cash planning tools available online. Um, there are uh, banks, you know, always happy to have conversations, uh, financial advisors who can help you start to think through some of these. If you've got a partner, uh, parents, you know, talk to them. I think the more that we encourage these conversations, uh, we will all be in a, in a better place moving forward. Brilliant. And then Jitanjali, over to you. Yeah, I would encourage everybody to use this lull in our lives uh, to catch up with the most mundane of tasks, you know, which is financial admin. Uh, and you know, I'm guilty of having avoided it for years as near as myself. Um, but anecdotally, I can tell you that um, you know, a lot of people are using this time to actually draw up a will. Um, I, I know I've done it myself, uh, you know, 12 years too late, but I've just done it. And if you already have one, then please do revisit it. Because the fact is that life is dynamic and, you know, things change, right? So the assets you would want to bequeath, you know, may have increased. The number of dependents you want to protect, you know, would have increased. So, you know, what was true for your life, you know, a few years ago, you know, obviously isn't true today. So please do revisit it. I know it sounds a bit morbid, um, but, you know, it is important because we've seen that, you know, bad things can happen. Um, and I think I gave you an example earlier about a client, you know, so if there are connected parties in, in this all important document, it's important to talk about it, you know. So if you have very young children and perhaps make your parents aware that, you know, here's my will and here's what it covers and here's where it's at. If you have older adult children, make them aware, because these are the people who will then have to, um, you know, act, you know, in case of any any eventuality. Let them know where it's stored, who the solicitors are, you know, if if uh, you have a trust you've created, then you know who the trustees are, and you know what uh, is underlying it, who are the beneficiaries, and so on and so forth. You must talk about these these plans. Equally, I think you know it's important um, to revisit other forms of financial planning that we created many years ago. I know I'm guilty of this, you know, all these years ago when I started my job, um, my first job, you had to fill a form and you tick a box about, you know, the kind of pension plan you were signing up for, uh, the kind of insurance you were signing up for and so on, uh, the kind of share save plan you wanted. And, um, you know, I'm guilty that when I moved jobs, you know, half of that I forgot to take with me. So it's important that, you know, as, as you move, you know, either between jobs or, you know, into business, uh, you know that these things are portable equally that you revisit them uh, and so this is a good time you know try and maintain that discipline so un unfortunately we don't look at these things either till you know we're in a very tragic situation or you know for decades on end. so use this time and if possible make it a discipline you know every three years sit down uh, you know potentially with your partner or spouse um, to, to talk through you know these are our goals uh, do we still have the same goals you know have our goals suddenly ballooned as they tend to and so what you've got in place, is it adequate to get you to the finish line? And if it isn't, then you need to course correct. And so then it's important to think of what tools you could use, right? And um, again, I think something like this webinar is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most banks have on their websites. I know we have, um, I think it's hsbc.co.uk, uh, the, the, um, you know, the wider bank's website, which has, uh, you know, an investment center. It has a share dealing platform. And whilst I'm not directing you to any uh, investment action, uh, you know, they have tools which will talk about things like, you know, compounding and, you know, the sooner you start saving, you know, the, the more powerful uh, it is for you. Uh, what's an ISA and what's the best way to, um, you know, invest in an ISA? 
um, things like that, which, you know, are the basics of finance. So, I mean, I'm assuming that, you know, our audience today has varying degrees of um, financial sophistication. I think one of the other things we should be, uh, all of us should consider doing is finding ways of diversifying, um, you know, both the investments that we make, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have a pot of cash, um, you know, like what I did years ago when I started, all my money was in one particular asset class, which is very risky. Um, and today, luckily, I'm not in that situation, you know, I have diversified out of it. So, you know, because of times like this, you know, in certain asset classes, are, you know, have fallen very, very sharply, at least you know um, that you have some sort of cushion to fall back on. Um, and similarly, you know, use, if you haven't been saving, use this as a wake-up call, you know, because people are losing their jobs. Uh, you know, people are being furloughed. So, you know, at least you have some sort of financial security, some sort of cushion, uh, you know, to go back to. And use this time, you know, log on to things like these webinars. I'm using this time. Uh, I'm not, um, you know, going to financial forums, but, um, you know, concepts like DNI, that's something I'm very interested in. So, you know, at seven o'clock, if I have the time, you know, I'm quite happily logging on to see what, you know, UK PLC is doing around DNI. So, you know, let's not, you know, lose this opportunity. Let's use this time wisely. Great. And then taking all of these comments into account, everything we've talked about so far before we uh, move on to our Q&A, because we do have uh, three or four to, to get through there. Um, what can a community like Quint essentially do to drive change on this issue, Jitandali? So I have no doubt that, you know, the participants today are all women who can be role models, you know, to their children, to their sisters, um, you know, to colleagues, to friends. Uh, so do, now that you've been a part of this discussion, you know, do talk about it and do encourage others uh, to join similar forums, uh, you know, to potentially read up. I think, you know, Annabelle has given us the name of a fantastic book. Uh, you know, let's all, you know, spend some time uh, helping ourselves, really. Um, and, you know, I think that the point uh, you made about children is important. When this lockdown started and, uh, you know, you had the chancellor on television a lot talking about job losses and, uh, you know, jobs being furloughed. I have a 12 year old at home who was very curious. Uh, so what on earth does that mean? And is that gonna happen to you? And I said, well, you know, these things happen. So it's important that, you know, when you, you get hold of some money to start saving for a rainy day, right? Financial planning, you know, the earlier you start, um, you know, the more powerful it is. And, you know, um, financial security doesn't come easily. You know, it comes after years and years of planning for it. Um, so I think we should all, um, you know, go out and talk to our friends and our loved ones um, about this. And I think it is a sad um, truth, but it is fact that women are going to be more adversely affected during this crisis, right? You know, either because, you know, more women are in healthcare and nursing and they're in the front line, so they're vulnerable, or because they just, you know, are potentially less skilled and are not in those senior roles. And so when it comes to job losses, you know, they're the ones who are losing their jobs and are being furloughed. And equally, we know the strain that comes from being at home, you know, managing your full-time role and being caregivers and, you know, with household chores. Um, so it's important that we're all resilient and we encourage, um, you know, the women in our circle to be equally resilient. Brilliant, Jitanjali. And Annabelle, to just quickly from you before we move on to the Q&A, anything you'd like to add there? Well, I think the key thing for groups like Quint essentially um, is to support their members, um, to give them access to events like this, um, but also to create that safe space that we talked about before. Uh, I think women typically feel much more comfortable asking questions uh, within groups of like-minded women. Um, you can also support each other with uh, conversations around investment. You know, Jitanjali referred to, to men having those conversations down the golf club, which we all know happens. You know, this is a great chance for women to take back some of that, uh, create their own network and self safe spaces to talk about how they want to manage and take control of their own finances. So I think Quint essentially can do a great job in helping support that. Brilliant. Thank you guys so much. So, so far we're doing pretty well. We're on time. Um, I, I, I can see a few quite detailed questions here. So um, if we bear in mind that we've currently got, well, oh no, five now. <laughs> um, let's see if we can power through these. Um, so starting with Laurie, uh, she says, Annabelle's point about her children really rang true. I've had money sitting in savings for a couple of decades, but I've never thought to invest it because of the risk. And I'm concerned about my children's protection and education. How can I feel more comfortable investing and should I? I'm worried about the risk and at the moment it's safe where it is. Annabelle, what do you think? Um, 
so I think this is a really interesting one. And, you know, the, the first port of call, I would say, Laurie, is to make sure that you're use, using your, uh, your tax allowances correctly. So junior ISAs, if it's relevant, ISAs are a great place to start investing for your, for your children. Uh, I even take it to extremes of, of helping the children to think through uh, what investments they might be interested in. So, you know, talking to them about different companies, what they see on the high street, uh, we talked recently about coronavirus, how different companies might be affected. Um, they're nine and six, so that's a limited conversation, <laughs> but I think it's a great way to start your children being uh, being interested in the conversation. So, you know, I'd absolutely encourage that conversation, Laurie. Um, you can learn together. You know, if you don't feel confident, yeah. um, then it's a great opportunity for you to have those conversations with your children and really educate yourselves together. And, the book I mentioned, which we'll, we'll put uh, out in an email or on the chat later, will be a great place for you to start. But, you know, it, it is um, definitely, you know, an interesting time to be thinking about investments with markets having come off. And Jitanjali, was there anything that you'd like to add there before we go to the next question? Yeah, just a quick point. You know, um, I just want to point out that, uh, you know, we need to consider there is inflation. So if you're going to leave money in cash over time, your money just doesn't re you know, retain its value. So whilst I'm not suggesting that you, you know, go off the cliff in terms of risk, uh, you, know, you do keep in mind the power of compounding. And you know, the example of children is fantastic, you know, all that gift money, right? And I'm guilty of it, you know, it goes into Nintendo and you know, Fortnite and what have you. Um, but you know, increasingly, I'm having this dialogue with my son. And um, you know, I'll tell you, similar to what Anna Annabelle has said, you know, learn with them. So I was on a webinar which was talking about gaming and how you know, these companies now seem to have a brighter future than ever before uh, because everybody's in lockdown and we all know what a lot of people are doing at home. Um, and again, I'm not promoting that as a theme, but what I did was I invited my son to listen to that. And I said, you know, you're mad about this product. Uh, you know, this will just give you some insight. You know, even if you, know, you don't want to put your 50 pounds into this, uh, you know, you'll at least see from a fund manager what his views are and, you know, what people consider when they make investment choices and why, you know, this apparently is, in a, you know, investment choice people are looking at now uh, he, he stayed barely 10 minutes uh, but you know sort of made him accountable you know that you know, these are things that you should you know pay attention to as you grow older great okay so moving on to octavia now she says i think this subject is fascinating i'm an investor and focus on supporting female founded companies why do you think it is perceived to be a safer bet to invest in male founded businesses through my experience it's often the other way around Potentially, what do you think? So that's so pertinent. You know, um, HSBC also supports the Albright, which is which has these monthly pitch days where they um, give an opportunity uh, for female entrepreneurs to come and um, pitch for funding. And through that, and working closely with them, we realized um, that for every hundred dollars that's invested by a VC, um, only two dollars would go towards a female-funded business. And, um, you know, personally, when you listen to uh, female fund managers, well, not female fund managers, I, I say fund managers who are investing with, uh, you know, this lens of gender diversity and gender balance, you know, the statistics actually play out, um, you know, to the contrary, right, that, you know, businesses that are led by women tend to outperform even in terms of uh, financial return at the end of a five or ten year period so it is counterintuitive but i think a part of it is also to do with the industry right i mean if you look at private equity and vc funding it is pretty much male dominated right and these are a lot of this deal making happens you know you know no offense but at a bar or you know on the golf course and women aren't really invited to, to, to the table so you know it is this this proverbial plu right people like us so people just feel more comfortable dealing with people that they're used to dealing with and so women get left out of that conversation and definitely more needs to be done uh, to change that and especially at times like this because in any case women as we say have a greater financial burden um and you know we're hearing from female founders it's even harder now to raise that capital Great, thank you so much, Jitanjali. And Annabelle, is there anything you'd like to add? No, not much to add, really. I mean, the honest answer is it's men making the decisions, therefore they yeah. give the money to men, you know, and, and until we change that dynamic, that will continue. Mm -hmm. um, I think the encouraging signs are that there are more female entrepreneurs going to market. Um, we are starting to see um, that conversation change, and I know it's a focus for Wealthy Her uh, to make sure that those female entrepreneurs get the funding that they need. Um, but until, the, until you see those changes in the, uh, 
in the teams at private equity and VC firms, I think this is going to persist for a little while longer. Great, thank you, Annabelle. I'm, I'm trying to see if I can uh, combine these two questions we've got here from Natasha and Veronique because they are on a similar, in a similar vein. So let's see what we can do. Uh, Natasha says, rather than re retrospectively trying to solve the issue, to what extent can the industry be proactive, for example, start the conversation earlier in a woman's life? She's thinking of conversations she has with her teenage daughter about money and wealth. And then Veronique says a similar sort of thing. Do they think that financial planning should be a part of the curriculum? And what advice do you have for parents who are trying to teach their children about financial planning? Annabelle, what do you think? So I absolutely think it should be part of the curriculum. Um, hence, I've been trying to re replicate it to some degree myself, uh, which isn't easy with, uh, with my two. Um, so yes, I think that schools have a, a large uh, part to play in this to help people, not just women, but but men as well, young boys, to feel confident in having those conversations uh, around their own finances. Um, you know, I think we as an industry are, are doing work, as I mentioned, you know, to try and help educate the next generation. So uh, we are very keen at RBC. We've got a seminar actually in July coming up to talk to our, our clients' children about the basics of financial planning. So, you know, we are starting to drive that conversation. I think you're right. I think it's very important that we, we don't just look retrospectively, but we think about how we move this conversation forward uh, for generations to come. Thank you so much. And Jitanjali, what do you think about that? I know there's a lot of stuff in there, so let me know if you need a repetition of it. No, I think, you know, a schools and curriculum uh, is hitting it on the head. And, you know, we did a lot of, we, I'm sure we all do a lot of CSR and a lot of it is, you know, focused at schools. And so we've actually introduced cheat sheets around finance uh, and, you know, left them with the governors trying to encourage them to in some way um, you know, mix it in with the curriculum. And, um, you know, it needs to start there. Absolutely. Um, and uh, similar to what Amber alluded to, uh, we're also hosting seminars, uh, webinars with NextGen where, you know, given the current environment, we are saying that, you know, both generations actually need to have these difficult conversations around of succession and inheritance. And on the back of that, you know, if you are then in line for that inheritance, having separate discussions um, with the next gen around, uh, you know, what money means to them and what their priorities are for that wealth and how best to go about um, managing it in a responsible way. Brilliant. So um, uh, I recognise that we are a little short on time, but there's one question left, so let's see if we can squeak it in at the end. Um, Gavin Oldham has asked, um, each year I analyse the subjects taken in A-levels, and it's striking that the top two female subjects are psychology and biology, and then whereas the top two male subjects are maths and physics. He says, given that financial awareness is so bound into mathematics, to the extent that HM Treasury thinks it should be the vehicle for financial education, um, a similar question perhaps to the previous two, could it be that the problem starts in schools? But quite an interesting one here. Why do girls choose psychology and biology in preference to maths in the first place? Could this be uh, nature or nurture? Jitanjali, what do you think? I think that's um, you know a problem uh, across the globe really. Fewer and fewer women go into STEM, right? So STEM subjects typically have been male dominated. Uh, you may have just a few pockets in the world where um, you know, there is more parity. And so I think we need to do more to encourage women to you know go into mathematics, into technology, and into the sciences. Um, and again, I think it's you know representation bias. You know, as they see those role models, uh, you know they realize that there is a career to be made uh, in these fields. So again, as part of our CSR, we also address career fairs. And you know, it used to be for 14, 15 year olds, but now we've started doing them as early as um, you know, with nine and 10 year olds to talk about various avenues um, you know, that you could choose as a profession. Uh, and it's, we do, since a lot of us come from a maths or an economics background, we talk about all the boring subjects we studied, but how that is a path to opening up um, you know, completely different and diverse careers. Great, and Annabelle, what do you think? So I'm going to take a different tack on this one because I actually come from an arts background, so I don't have okay. maths. Um, I, I um, went through sort of two, three years coming out of university, having studied languages and, and had to do conversion courses, uh, getting to grips with economics and stats. Um, so, you know, I actually think whilst recognising that maths is, of course, incredibly important, um, it is also important that we have diversity of thought um, in background of the people who you know are advising our clients now actually i think you know psychology is a really interesting one because if you look at behavioral psychology around investments um it is you know 
that there are some really interesting studies around that. So, you know, I, I think we have to be balanced in that argument. Um, but I, I, I do recognize that, you know, there is an issue um, globally, as Jitanjali said, uh, of girls not particularly wanting to do um, STEM subjects. Um, hopefully that shifts. You know, I think we are seeing increasingly uh, girls wanting to go into, uh, into coding and tech. Um, so that helps to, uh, helps to push girls into a different direction that perhaps we haven't seen before. Great. Jitanjali Annabelle, thank you so much. Um, we're, we're almost at the finish line. <laughs> so just to wrap up, there is just one final question because we've covered a lot of bases in this conversation and hopefully uh, to those who ask the questions, I hope we've, um, Annabelle and Jitanjali have answered your questions. Um, but, but considering the fact that we started this conversation, uh, just in general, how are we going to improve our relationship with money? Um, can we wrap up with any top tips or advice for those listening today? Perhaps if there's one thing they should be doing to kind of start improving their relationship with money, what should it be? Annabelle. Uh, only one thing, talk about it. <laughs> well, uh, yes, talk about it. So, you know, have conversations, friends, family, um, and try and get the basics right. Um, so understand, you know, what you, what you're entitled to in terms of ISAs, uh, pensions, et cetera, put the basic blocks in place uh, and then don't be afraid of it going forward. Brilliant, and Jitanjali, what do you think? Yeah, I agree, absolutely. Have those conversations, you know, take some time to ask those questions, you know, there's no such thing as a silly question because these are critical issues. Um, and the earlier you address them, um, you know, I suppose the, the more confident you will feel because you would have dealt with it and you know, you'll see things evolve uh, as you go through life. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, uh, I think that all that's left to remain is for me to say thank you so much to everyone who has tuned in to listen today. We've really appreciated uh, you taking the time out of your evening, uh, not to mention Annabelle and Jitanjali, of course, uh, bringing your expertise to this conversation. And you are both a driving force behind the Wealthy Hair Network. So uh, I know we're all very much in appreciation of you. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, we're slightly early, so I'm sorry about that, but we were just uh, really good at answering all the questions there. So I think um, thank you very much, and, and that's it from us. Thank you, thanks Vicky. Thank you. Thank you for joining us everybody, and thank you to our wonderful panelists and uh, moderator. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion, and on behalf of Wealthy Earth, Thank you very much and have a good evening.